My guests today are Jamie Peterson and Rebecca Westbrook Toker, the co-founders of Reconnect Nature School that launches in August of 2024. Uh, so just here at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey, um, Reconnect Nature School offers up to full-time enrollment five days a week for learners, uh, including uh, part-time options as well, but the full-time program tends to be popular, or so our founders have seen so far. And uh, all of the students are legally recognized as homeschoolers. So Jamie and Rebecca, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. We're so happy to Thank be so here. Thanks for having us. It's so great to have you here uh, and to hear that you're already at a point where you are launching with seven kids out of the gate, but have a lot more interest and will continue to accept enrollments uh, rolling throughout the first academic year. And I know you said you're you're targeting middle grade, kind of 10 to 14 year olds for now. Uh, so just really excited to hear about your story. But let's start with a little bit about your backgrounds each of you, uh, how you got into education initially, uh, and maybe Rebecca, we'll start with you. Um, thank you. Hi. Um, I grew up in North Central Texas, and uh, from the time I've ever been able to have any kind of conscious thought about it, I've known that I was a teacher. Um, I, <laughs> When I went to kindergarten, I would come home and teach my sister what I learned that day. And my mom thought we were playing until Lisa started writing notes for her at three years old. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I know that makes me kind of a weirdo. I'm the only person that I know uh, who's just always known what I was. Uh, but I always knew that education was my path. And uh, I also, around fourth grade, kind of keyed into realizing that there were some things about the system that prioritized certain skills and certain personalities and really denigrated others. I'm very good at industrial education. I can follow the rules and I can check the boxes and get the smiley faces. Um, but I remember having that conscious awareness that the standardized testing it was kind of like a party trick for me because I could figure out what the test wanted me to say and that my friends who weren't scoring as well, I knew that they were just as intelligent as I was. There was something wrong with the testing. You know what I mean? So from very early on, I kind of had a niggling that there was something in the system that wasn't working for everybody. Um, and then... I actually started teaching really, really young. Um, I got involved. Um, I grew up on a horse farm, so I've been riding my entire life. Um, and my family volunteered with a program that was down the road for us. Um, it was a, a summer camp program for kids with juvenile diabetes. Uh, it's one of the biggest in the world, and it's really well-funded and beautiful campus. And, you know, they had a horse back program. Uh, so my family would volunteer and help them get uh, TAC, et cetera. Um, and I got an internship with that program when I was 15. And then somehow wound up running the program at 16, which I'm not sure was fully legal. Um, <laughs> but I did that. And then I, um, I don't know. I just have always had my hand in a few teaching pots through college. I uh, would go up to uh, Ohio and teach writing at a summer camp up there. Um, and I also taught zero level college courses, the English and writing in our university's uh, learning center. Um, I joined the Peace Corps and I was <laughs> teaching then. Um, I came back to the States, had a self-contained autism classroom. Um, and then when my family, after we had our son, um, we moved to Chattanooga to be near my in-laws and let them get to know him. And that's how I discovered the forest school movement. 
Um, so I fell in with Wahatchee Forest School because I really wanted my son to do forest kindergarten. Um, I thought it was a beautiful model. Um, and I've been with them since 2017. Um, I, I did take a year out during the, pa during the pandemic because I got a grant opportunity at one of our local middle schools because I actually really do believe in public education and that everyone should have access to it. So I got a grant position to take the four school methodology into an inner city school. At least that's what it said on paper. Uh, <laughs> so I went back into a public school situation uh, in the 2020-2021 school year. Um, and man, I loved the kids in the community, but it reinforced why I left uh, the public system. So I went back to the forest and um, uh, they made a position for me basically as Miss Frizzle. Um, and so as I was teaching their uh, school-wide STEAM programming, um, but now I have a seventh grader. I do not have um, a suitable alternative for him uh, Wahatchee does not want to move up to middle grades, and there are some inequities in that si system it, within Wahatchee that we can't seem to break through. Like, I know that this needs to be accessible for everyone, and Chattanooga is in the process of becoming the first national park city, and we've had the town motto of being, like, the outdoor city, but there's always been that inequity and it bothers me, the outdoor city for whom. And so I, I want to do something that's getting more kids out and especially kids who aren't necessarily upper middle class white kids, you know? Yeah. So it's interesting. I was in Chattanooga and around Tennessee earlier this spring visiting um, various founders, many of whom like you have, who have started schools and spaces over the past few years. Also many who were former public school teachers. I had on the podcast recently Bloomsbury Farm School uh, in Smyrna outside of Nashville. So it's great to see the sort of farm and forest school movement happening in Tennessee and especially around the Chattanooga area. Jamie, I wanna to get to you in a minute, but just one other question for you, Rebecca, you said you went back into the, to the middle school environment and public education and realized that it hadn't changed, that it wasn't um, an ideal environment for you as a teacher, potentially for students too. But I'm curious if you talk a little bit more about what the issues were there. What I was seeing in the middle school, I mean, number one, like I walked in with my uh, <laughs> my NASA globe program binder and set it on the table for my interview. And I said, this is what I want to do. I want to have kids doing hands-on citizen science. I want to take these kids outside. And they were like, great. We shook hands, signed the papers. And then from that point on, getting the kids outside was extremely difficult. And I, you know, like there was a disconnect there because I told them what I was there for. And, you know, I'm a STEAM teacher, but my sciences are the natural sciences, right? And the methodology that we use in forest school is is very child-centered, child-led, um, and it's, it's not the industrial model. And so when you're then working for administrators, who don't know how to evaluate that, they think that you just never learned class management or that you don't plan your lessons. And that's not what it is at all. When you're trying to go out and let nature give you a prompt, you have to be quick on your feet and ready to facilitate and interpret whatever you come across, you know? And you also have to be willing to let go of the idea that you had, you know, what you were hoping that they were gonna find or gonna see. You have to be willing to let go of that if something else presents itself, because nature is an amazing teacher and everything is science, but you just have to be ready <laughs> to interpret that for kids. And I found that really difficult. And it was also breaking my heart to hear sixth and seventh graders like talking so wistfully about wishing they had time to play. 
-hmm. because it was during the pandemic. So we were doing um, a lot of that hybrid education and we were also doing a lot of like online during periods of the year. So I was focusing on uh, soundscapes as a way to kind of bring us all together um, of being able to go outside and sit and be in the space where you are and hear the different layers of what's around you. Um, and like sitting and prompting students about that, they they would be very sad about the fact that they didn't have any time to play anymore. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I just, I found it to be a big mismatch with that age and stage and what they need. Mm. Because they need to be up and moving. They need purposeful work. And they definitely 100% need to be engaged socially with their peers. That's all they want to do and all they right. need to do. And we spend all our energy trying to keep them apart and working by themselves. And right. it's just not, it's not what they need. Yeah. And it's just too bad too, Rebecca, because it sounds like the administration <clears throat> had good intentions. They wanted you to do this sort of hands-on uh, project-based outdoor focused work. And yet just the constraints of the system made that difficult in practice. Um, but hopefully there's opportunities there for the future, especially as you are building these alternatives and then potentially can influence um, conventional classrooms as well. So yeah, I think, yeah. I'm sorry, I no, just no, want to please. say one more thing. Um, I'm kind of uh, like a science hippie, you know, and I think they were thinking a little more like Bill Nye, jazz hands, science magic tricks. And that's just not my shtick. You know, I that's not what I do for kids. Um, I like them to get out and see what they find interesting. Yeah. yeah. So Jamie, what about you? What's your pathway to education and now education entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I, um, Rebecca and I actually have very similar childhoods. Um, also grew up in a really rural area and um, very, very agrarian. Um, but then when I got out of high school, I started immediately with um, the Boys and Girls Club. So my entire experience has been rooted in this community um, based education. Um, and so I, I started with the Boys and Girls Clubs locally, and then I worked my way up to um, running a grant that allowed us to have a teen center. Um, I spent some time in um, the four corners of the Colorado area working um, with some local groups out there and, and some of our Native nations, also um, developing um, after school programs and summer programming and then came back and did more community-based um, educational work and spent then um, close to seven years in Memphis working at mental and behavioral detention centers as a teacher and moved to Chattanooga where I have worked at several of our Title I high schools here locally. And so when I um, went to the four school elementary last year, it was, um, always supposed to be um a break with the intention to return back um it's like my heart is really rooted in in the community-based um work and in, in community-based schools like really um building those relationships and understanding those communities and diving in and working really really hard with one group of people but in our course of kind of finishing up last year this middle school program um, became an option. And what happened was that last year, one woman um, launched a program and it was just her. And so she was doing all of the administrative work and all of the academic work and all of the social media work, like everything. And she burned out really, really quickly. And she was going to um, fold it. And Rebecca was looking at, you know, needing a place for her son because her son was in that program. And then I was really itching to get back to a community facing model. Um, I, like Rebecca had said, like we, um, I really have always wanted a space, like an in-between space where the kids that I worked with would have a chance to just 
um, relax and be kids and, and play and have that relief, which we did find in, in the nature-based programming, but also understanding the importance of being good citizens and raising good citizens and being community facing. And so it was really excited for the both of us that we could take this model, um, you know, that Rebecca is super familiar with and loves very much and expand it up into middle grades. And then we could also make it community facing. And so one of our big drives, um, that we're even doing this first year is to be involved with as many different community groups as possible and understanding like Rebecca was saying that kids deserve or kids of the middle ages really need purposeful work. And I really um, benefited from being involved in community groups as a middle-aged, a middle schooler. Um, and then realizing that I could have a say in political things. I could have a say in um, community-based projects. I could um, build something with my peers and then everybody else will be able to interact with it. And we want to, combine those two things, combine the urban um, care for our communities and then the um, naturalist care for our, our planet and, and say, if you're going to be a good steward, you need to be a good steward um, of both things. Um, and also similar to what Rebecca was saying, I um, have always, this has always been the path for me. Like there has not been a different path. I uh, One of the earliest memories that, um, not one of the earliest memories, but a very profound memory I have is being about five and telling everyone like I want to um I want to own a school one day and I want to be an artist and these are the two things that I do I'm also a, a local artist um here in Chattanooga and I work in the maker arts is how I call them so um ceramics fiber woodworking printmaking um and so combining both of those things also to um to launch a school and, and really connect our kids with the communities around them so oh, great. So let's talk more about what it means to have a nature school. Um, does that mean that you're outside all of the time? Do you not have a brick and mortar location in Chattanooga or is it a hybrid? Um, and I know nature schools look different, you know, depending on where they are and who's running them and their different missions and visions. But I'd love to hear what it looks like for Reconnect Nature School. Yeah, it's absolutely. Your... Go ahead, Jamie. I was just going to say, um, traditionally for the, I mean, the most of the nature schools we see kind of globally are the elementary age groups. Like it's very big as a nature preschool. And then some groups have brought it up to like K through fifth grade. And those are all um, nature immersive programs, right? Everything is outside. Um, you you may have an indoor bathroom, very likely not. Um, and, um, and, and it is really important for those um, younger children to understand how to regulate their bodies and push their boundaries and be outside 100% of the time. But I think I'm passed it off to Rebecca to say that when we were looking at leveling it up, we um, understood that our, our kids' bodies are a little bit different and you get weirder aches and pains and, and stuff when you um, move into pu puberty. And also the importance of privacy is a little bit more important. So we um, decided to do kind of a hybrid program where we do have an indoor classroom and an indoor space. We also were like, listen, like your body hurts so much when you're kind of growing and going through puberty and if math gets way, way harder and maybe you shouldn't be trying to figure out like hard concepts and also cold and wet, like let's give you a space that if you need it, you can have it. But I'll pass off to Rebecca. I'm sorry, I think I interrupted you. Oh, no, that's okay. We, we, we've both rehearsed this and we kind of give the same spiel. Um, but we understand. So I, like I said, I've been with Wahachi for many years, um, not since the very beginning, but pretty close. And so I've watched as we've grown up and had to make those considerations for each grade level. Um, I've been there when we integrated technology for our fourth and fifth graders. Um, and so I, I feel like we were able to really look at that and think about what this means for middle grades kids. Like, what do they need um, rather than trying to stick to like just the idea that we're outside all the time? And we know that for these kids, uh, technology is so very important. So we have to have a space that has Wi-Fi. We have to have a space where we can have devices and they can learn how to use, you know, Google Suite. They need to know how to create a Word document. They need to make a PowerPoint slide. Um, I don't know, maybe it's a spreadsheet, depends. Um, 
we need to be able to do those things. And we also, Jamie and I, have a bunch of stuff because we've been teaching for a long time. Uh, we're both... Um, we both have like all of these art supplies, microscopes, et cetera. So we need somewhere to put all that. So um, yeah, that's, that's what we looked for. And that's what we eventually found was a place where we had wonderful outdoor space to explore and also a nice, dry, secure indoor space. I love it. And I want to touch a little bit on, on our space real fast, if that's okay. Please. Okay, so we have um um we have secured a location um and it is inside of our local Unitarian Universalist Church, the Univer Unitarian Universalist Church of Chattanooga. Um and it is on five acres and it has a creek access and it has a little designated bird area, bird sanctuary area, and it has lots and lots of trails and lots and lots of space for us to be outside and also an indoor classroom that we can use. And one of the things that is really exciting and unique, especially combining our two visions to make this school, is that this five acres is located right in the heart of our city. So it is... Um, it, I used to work at a local high school um, called Brainerd High School, and it is one of our more, um, it's considered our inner city school, um, which is a really problematic term, but that's what people understand. Um, and this this campus is a mile and a half from that school. So it is right in the middle of an urban area, but it's still like a natural landscape. And so it it really merges perfectly with what we want to do. And, and, and allows us a lot of opportunities for urban ecology and um, also land stewardship and also community stewardship. And um, as far as how it looks day to day, it will be primarily outside and we have a classroom for when we need it is kind of how we're looking at it. Mm, yeah, <clears throat> so great. So you're at launch with seven students already, you expect that number to grow, uh, although I know you want to keep the program intentionally small uh, to retain that sort of individualized learning approach. Um, of the seven who are with you at the start, are they all coming from that elementary school nature program? Um, so are they coming from conventional classrooms? Tell us about who those seven are and why are they attracted to Reconnect Nature School? We have one kiddo who is coming up uh, from Wahatchee Forest School. Um, he was uh, a member of our second graduating class of fifth graders. Um, and his family really wanted to keep a, a forest school education for him. His mom is a, a public school teacher. Um, she's out right now, like taking care of little ones, but she just felt like sending him to middle school was not the best fit for him. Um, and I guess we could technically say that my kiddo is a four school kid. Uh, <laughs> so he's been with me on this journey. He has chosen to uh, go into the public school at different times in his educational career. Um, but right now, um, as a seventh grader, um, with some neurodiversity, we, he really feels like forest school is the best choice for him. And I agree. Um, and that kind of says a little bit about like what we have. So the people that we have that are coming to us, uh, people, people choose to homeschool for very specific reasons. Um, and a lot of them are doing it because their kid is not thriving in the public system for one reason or another. Um, Jamie and I have a lot of experience with kids with ADHD, um, autism, uh, sensory issues, uh, noise sensitivity. Like we like the neuro spicy babies and we get a lot of them. And that's a thing, like my background is special education. Um, and that's something that I noticed through all those years at Wahatchee is that we have a high prevalence of kids with those neurodiversities and we're able to actually meet those needs by keeping classes small, by letting them move and like letting them learn how to self-regulate, you know, just directly teaching those skills and allowing them the space and the time to do that. Um, it's really the great leveler. And that's another reason that I just, 
I love this methodology so much is because it lets everybody thrive. And when you build a community like that, a tight little community of kiddos, there's always an opportunity through every academic year, you get to see every kid struggle and be supported. And you also get to see every kid have their chance to shine. And it's, we call it forest school magic and it it really is like that. And so I'm very excited to be moving this up to a group of kids that, you know, we don't do much for alternative education for middle school kids. You know, I feel like they kind of get lost. So we're trying to make a space for them. Do you think you'll expand? I know you're just starting, but here I am asking you about expansion. Do you think you'll expand to a high school program too? Or what's next? I imagine the families are going to be so satisfied with your educational model that they'll want to stay till graduation. There's a tentative, like with, we say it without saying it. That we're like <laughs> one day if high school, but it is something that um, we are not opposed to. We want to make sure that we get all of like this is one of the reasons why becoming a micro school is really appealing to us is because then we can meet all of these like qualifications to have older kids. Um, but it would be something we would grow into, right? So we'll keep our kids, and then when they need a higher grade, then we can sit down and evaluate that. But I come from a high school background and I would be really happy to have high schoolers. And yeah. if all of the things that we do would be really exciting to do with high schoolers. I mean, um, doing nature-based education is great with elementary kids. It's very cute. But then when you get into like middle schools and high schools, you can do some really cool research and you can take them on some really cool trips and we can do some deep dives into the nitty gritty. Um, but to then back up and answer do, I don't know, carry on the answer from your question is that a lot of the kids that we have have been in some public education experience, did not thrive, and then were pulled out for different reasons and just haven't landed anywhere yet. Um, we have um, just a few that have been homeschooled the whole time, um, and, it, and it works really well for them. And then we did not launch our program early enough to start getting the word out for our local um, our local school system. So all of our lotteries had already closed and everyone was really established kind of where they were going to be. Um, so it is a is a process this year. And as we start to be able to accept some more um, funding and get a scholarship program going to really reach out to like the schools in the area and proximity of our of our campus and and offer some um, yeah some alternative programming for them. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit more about your current structure and your future structure. I know that currently um, you're operating as a program for homeschoolers, but Jamie, you mentioned that you want to eventually pursue um, sort of state recognized certification as a private school. I know in Tennessee, there's multiple categories that you can apply for as a private school. Um, and some of those categories enable access to, you know, various education savings account programs that defray tuition costs. And I know access is a key priority for you. You told me that your full-time program, the five-day-a-week full-time program, uh, is currently $800 a month or $8,000 a year. You also have the part-time enrollment options at, at less money. But uh, your goal is really to have this be tuition free uh, for any child in the area that wants it. Tell us a little bit about um, that plan for greater accessibility and also to become a recognized private school. So um, part of the reason accessibility is the key word, right? And especially if we want to launch this as a program for everyone, we want to take out as many roadblocks as we possibly can. And so one of those roadblocks is that it's not, um, it is not the most complicated thing in the world, but it is a lot of extra steps to register as a homeschooler and then keep up with all that paperwork and then register with another school. Um, and that is an immediate roadblock that somebody could look at and be like, this is really too much for me. So we want to take that off and, and getting the micro school recognition, recognition certification there we go, um, would really help and assist that and make it just an easier, more accessible program. We also 
once we get that, we'll have access to these educational savings accounts and we can work through with our parents on how to apply for them and how to receive them and then how to put them towards their educational goals. Um, we also understand um, without being too um, sterile about talking about it, what we are, right? We are an organization that wants to connect um, traditionally underserved communities to the outdoors. And that is a huge funding opportunity right now. We are also an organization that is STEAM-based, which is also a huge funding or opportunity. And we do a lot of work with the NASA GLOBE program and different um, NASA type um, trainings and, and programs. And so we have a lot of opportunities to receive a lot of foundational support and grant support and ongoing support. And so it is the goal of this year as we do school to work behind the scenes and build up that foundation um, and get as much support as we can so that next year or the year after we can launch as, as fully free. So the hope is that, that we can um, reach out for donations and reach out for foundational support and then also be able to secure these ESA options and offer a reduced tuition next year at the very least with some um, full scholarships and then move into having full scholarships after that. Um, We're not 100% sure how to sustain that long term, We, um, but we do want to make sure that we do not turn children away based on income. Like if this is something that your child needs, this shouldn't just be accessible for those who have means. And um, and then also understanding the current economic state and then and then what it takes to get to have an extra eight thousand dollars a year. I mean it's not something that me and my partner would be able to swing and we both have jobs, you know. So understanding that it's not even um if you uh, it, it is a big sacrifice and education should not be a big sacrifice. And, and we've talked about how we, we have sort of as a society come to the conclusion that education is the number one way to get out of poverty and you shouldn't have to pull yourself out of poverty to get an education to pull yourself out of poverty. And so we want to do what we can to bridge those gaps and make it as accessible as possible. Right. And Tennessee right now has a limited um, education choice program. I know there's efforts to expand that to apply to more uh, families throughout the state that, to your point, and that allows this greater accessibility uh, to different learning options that are the right fit for each child and each family. So I'm curious about your biggest challenges uh, leading up to this point of launch, because this was a relatively quick process from you uh, having the idea to open this middle school to then open it, actually opening your doors. Um, what was the biggest challenge for you in that pre-launch kind of startup process? The biggest challenge for me, honestly, was realizing that I, I was going to have to leave Wahatchee if I was going to um, do this and make sure that I had an option for my kiddo. Because we didn't find out until March um, that his program wasn't going to continue. Um, and by that point, all of the lottery school announcements had been released and it, I, I didn't have any options for him. And I, you know, just had to, <sighs> I gave myself a month <laughs> um, to figure it out, to see if I could find a different option. And then I just, I had to come to terms with leaving a school and leaving a program that I really, really loved, you know? And so I, I do hope that we can continue to work together and collaborate um, in the future, but that, you know, can't lie. That was sad. <laughs> yeah. Letting go of um, something that you really enjoyed and a, a job that was really rewarding to venture into the unknown world of entrepreneurship. Um, you know, definitely a big shift. What about for you, Jamie? I think that um, so much of it, or a lot of it is this uh, imposter syndrome. Like, it, it's, can we do this? And it's a weird combination for me where I also like experience a lot of imposter syndrome. And I also have this weird optimism that I'll be able to figure anything out. And so it's, um for me, it was that kind of um tension between being like, am I qualified to do this? And also I know that I can fully figure this out. Um, But figuring out 
or it's just been, um, I would say challenging, but also really exciting. Like I, I love to learn. And I also, um, like my degree is in pre-law, like all of the logistics of it are very, very interesting and cool to me and also very overwhelming. And so diving into that and understanding like, what can we do and where are the loopholes and what can we do? And then somebody, we would have a meeting with somebody and they would open up like five or 10 more things. And then I would be like, now I have all these extra special interests to dive into. Um, and, and dealing with how overwhelming all of the options are and overwhelming how all of the um, paperwork trails that you have to follow to make something launch. Um, and then finding the decision that is right for us and being sure that like we can, we can make it happen. Um, so it's it's been a fun little roller coaster of emotions to be like, this sounds really exciting. I don't know if I can do this. Of course we can do this. It'll be fine. And then and then actually do it. So amazing. Well, I'll have to check in with you uh, again in a few months and see how launch went and how your enrollment continues to grow and what that roller coaster ride is like. But as we begin to wrap up, I'd love to just hear your thoughts on the larger ecosystem of innovative education options emerging in the greater Chattanooga area. I was really impressed when I visited in the spring um, at the number of new schools and spaces that have opened. And it seems like that momentum is continuing. I know I'll be visiting the Chattanooga area again this fall to meet with more founders. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. What are you seeing locally in terms of alternative education models? And where do you see this momentum going? It's really, really exciting. Like you just said, like there is so much that's happening in Chattanooga. Um, it is kind of confusing because we do have um, a magnet program. So we have a lot of specialized schools in that way. Um, and I do think that Chattanooga and has- Rebecca, done... maybe we can just define magnet schools are uh, public schools- that just often have a different theme or a different mm -hmm. focus, but they are within the public school districts. Yeah, I just wanted yes. to clarify. Yeah, <laughs> good good call there. Um, and I have seen Chattanooga do a better and better job of streamlining the lottery system and uh, making sure that all families have access to any of those schools that work for them. Uh, but in terms of uh, like looking at the private programs, the independent programs, the micro schools, um, more and more of it is happening. So you're getting that community centered education that's specifically meeting needs of students and families like in the place that's close to them, even as Hamilton County now has launched a policy of uh, school conglomeration. So we're getting bigger and bigger public schools. And the response to that is these private programs that are intentionally keeping things small and saying, look, if this school is not working for your kid, I think we can work for your kid. And um, even just many of the families uh, that I've known that have come through my program over the years, um, I've been able to reach out to them and see what's going on just to keep my finger on the pulse of like what's happening here and if we could launch this school. Um, and I'm just, I'm finding so many families that are able to make thoughtful decisions for their kids and they're very satisfied with being able to find something where they feel like their child is seen um, and is being cared for. Um, and that's, man, you couldn't ask for anything more than that. Love that. Jamie, what about you? What do you see as the future of the innovative education landscape uh, near you? I'm really excited about <clears throat> having alternatives to traditional public school. It doesn't work for everyone. Rebecca and I both kind of like, we're traditional learners that worked for, it would have worked for me, um, but having options and having like smaller classrooms. And then also what I'm really excited about is as the, these initiatives grow, then we retain talent. Um, Chattanooga kind of, um, it's really well known that we don't pay as well as other school districts in Tennessee. We definitely don't pay as well as school districts in Georgia, which is right across the board. It's about 20 minutes from anywhere you live in Chattanooga. And so retaining quality teachers has been um, 
really difficult for the school system. And I think I, I love all the teachers that I know, um, but having an alternative space for those teachers to go so that we can keep them in the community, which is really exciting. And, and being able to say, if this is not working for you, there are other spaces for you to go so that you can keep doing work in the community that you live in. Um, the other thing that I think is really um, exciting as we move forward as alternative schools and as micro schools and as um, you know homeschool programs, and we, we move towards making it more and more accessible is that we um, recently had a free Montessori elementary school open up in Chattanooga. And it's kind of launched this idea or helped to ignite this idea that you can have these specialized education programs and they can be free and accessible to the public. And it launched like the opening of this school has helped to launch other um, micro schools and, and smaller schools um, kind of as a result of it, but it, it is also exciting for me to say, these do not have to be exclusionary experiences anymore. If your child is not thriving in our public school system, then there are other options that you can get them into that also are not exclusive to just the wealthy people in the city. So that's really exciting. And that's where I would like preferably love to see it go is to say that we're all in this together and we're all offering something and we're all trying to make it accessible for everybody um and have that kid focused in that way instead of um like um capitalistic focused so i'm really excited about that but i mean again you're working within the free market you are entrepreneurs and thankfully you were able to take this leap into entrepreneurship uh, to be able to create those options that families want. And so it really is that that free market capitalism, that entrepreneurial mindset that's enabling these options to expand. Uh, and then ultimately with new education policy and choice policies to make those more accessible to any family that wants these alternative options. So exciting to see where that goes. So I'd love to uh, have you share how my listeners and viewers can connect with you, learn more about Reconnect Nature School, and follow your progress in these initial few weeks. What is yeah, the best well, we way? Have, yeah, we have all of the socials, right? So um, we are on Instagram at, I want to make sure to run it, at Reconnect Nature School. Um, we are on TikTok at reconnect.nature. Um, we are on Facebook at Reconnect Nature School. And then we are also online at reconnectnatureschool.org. So it's it's a real, pretty much the same branding across the board. Um, and so any of any of those areas are easy to connect with us and they're all linked together. So if you go to reconnectnatureschool.org, all of our socials are linked on the bottom. And then also um there's a way to email both of us from that site. So exciting. Well, best wishes uh, for the initial few weeks of your launch. I'm excited to, again, follow your progress. And Rebecca Westbrook Toker, Jamie Peterson, thank you so much for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. Us.